our happy days here again for high drama. I sure hope so. Diane Weiss stars as Winnie in the new revival of Samuel Beckett's Happy Days at Theatre for a New Audience in Brooklyn, originally from Yale Repertory Theatre. Winnie is the eternal optimist, even though she's buried up to her waist in a mound of dirt. She's talking about how wonderful things are, and she's bringing everything out of her bag, including, including her beloved revolver brownie, which she kisses. <laughs> her husband, the aged Willie, is around somewhere. Sometimes he comes out of his hole, but he's not the crawler he used to be. He's not the crawler she married. Diane Wiest is magnificent. She has incredible vocal range and a real musical quality to her voice and beautifully developed arms that she uses greatly. And even if you think Beckett is a hard pill to swallow, he isn't in this. Diane Wiest makes this 100% pure theatrical magic, fully guaranteed. So I would give this a big happy face. At the public is Martin Sherman's Gently Down the Stream. It's a touching love story between the older beau, played by Harvey Fierstein, or Fierstein, and the younger Rufus, Gabriel Ebert, between 2001 and 2014 in Shepherd's Bush, London. Gabriel Ebert's puppy dog exuberance has met a great fall with Harvey's vulnerable skilliness. Christopher Sears bursts in and shakes things up in a good way. Sean Mathias has directed Martin Sherman's time and play with attention to such emotional detail that in the end I was left emotionally invested in the characters and the play. And it's interesting that it touches on two plays I've just seen recently. Daniel's Husband about gay marriage and how we don't want to be like the heteros. We want to be different. So some gay guy is opposed to the marriage. That's Harvey Firestein. And then also The View Upstairs. There's this whole touching monologue about, you know, this bar that burned down in New Orleans. I mean, there's... Because Gabriel er Ebert is filming... Uh, Harvey Firestein because he he was a piano player for Mabel Mercer and he's fascinated by his Harvey's history so we get these wonderful monologues from Harvey and it's just it's so wonderful and good and well done and kudos to everyone continuing at the public is their mobile productions units production of Twelfth Night mobile production usually goes to um, prisons, maybe uh, schools, community centers, but here's a chance to see it at the public. And they set Twelfth Night in very much Gloria Stefan's Miami, and it's very colorful, very musical. It's the story about shipwrecked twins, Viola and Sebastian, who are seeking shelter in Illyria, unbeknownst to each other. And Viola gets uh, dresses as a boy to work for Orsino, who's in love with Olivia. It's really about people being in love with the wrong person, and also about Malvolio, sort of a um, a servant who's too uppity but gets uh, badly tricked and treated badly, and but all ends up well in the end. And it was a beautiful, fun, short production that I think anybody would enjoy. It's almost as good as the stuff they do in the park. So definitely see uh, Public Theater's mobile unit, Twelfth Night. I can't resist saying this. He's uppity and he gets his comeuppance. Oh. <laughs> oh. Oh, the play that goes wrong is about, guess what? A play that goes wrong. It takes place in a small village or somewhere in England and all the actors are pretty bad and um, everything that can go wrong does go wrong. This is a concept that goes back to Shakespeare's time with Midsummer Night's Dream with Pyramus and Thisbe and is a staple of comedy. Um, the fun of this is watching really good actors who are very good at physical comedy. It's also trying to find new way, they find new ways of making things go wrong. And also we should explain that the, the play they are doing is a murder terrible. mystery. Which is pretty <laughs> terrible. Yeah, yeah, you know those wonderful British like mousetrap murder mysteries. Right, from from even before mousetrap, you know, there's something they've and, 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 and because the actors keep getting hurt 
and then, so they have yeah. to enlist like the stage manager and and the, the director and everything. Yeah. They're, they're practically the pulling props people. are all done. You know, out of the audience. Listen. It was a. Fu I was. Hysterical. I will say this though. After a while, towards the end, I was feeling that it stretched a little bit too much. Unlike Noses Off, you don't see the backstage, you don't see the act, you don't really get to know the actors that much. There's a little bit of difference, but not very much. And after a while, I was saying, well, if you've seen one, you know, piece of scenery fall down, after a while, it gets to be too much. Nonetheless, it's a lot, it's very funny, and if you like slapstick comedy, this is definitely for physical you. Physical comedy. Physical comedy. Well, yeah. see, unlike you, I actually like this better than Noises Off. Okay. I thought this was funnier. Okay. And I think it helped with, I, I have got to praise the guy next to me. I don't know his name. I, I wish I could take him to every single comedy <laughs> I go to. For the first time in my life, I was with someone who laughed and enjoyed <laughs> themselves. I yeah. got carte blanche. I was, like, allowed to laugh and enjoy myself. Instead of Whoa. people yelling at me saying, shh. You know, it's a comedy. It's funny. No, you gotta be quiet. But yeah, you, I mean, but you laugh like a hyena. He laughed Eva. worse than me. <laughs> he laughed worse than me, oh. that, which made it even better. He guffawed <laughs> with such trumpetiness. Which is fine. Oh, so I oh, was. Feels, now, now, don't worry. The actors will be very happy if mm. you laugh hysterically. Yes. Yeah, so, so to me, this was like the happiest time I have ever had in the theater. The play was brilliant beyond belief, and it was just so funny. The the. The way they handled the, the physical comedy was just, it was like, oh my gosh. I, yeah, they do find variations, and that's why it, it, it works, uh, for the most part, it works very well. Um, well. You know, I did get a little bit well, slapstick down. But, uh, not me. But I'm the, not, you know, I would still recommend it for a like. I think to me, th there's nothing wrong with the play that goes wrong. It's all right <laughs> to me. Okay, it's mostly all right. Target Margin is presenting Morning Becomes Electra, the three-act tragedy based on the Oristaya, written by Eugene O'Neill, and it's at Abrams Art Center, directed by David Herskovitz, and you're all over the place. Um, there's a section that's in the lobby, then you walk around the orchestra area, then you're all the way up in the balcony, and later in different parts of the orchestra, and you end up on stage. It's the story about a homecoming veteran and his adulterous wife and his demise, and then the effect on his two children, um, Vinny, who's Lavinia, more the Electra figure, and Oren, the Orestes. And it's really about a downfall of a family, just like the downfall of the House of Atreus. <laughs> but it's incredibly involving, especially towards the end. You're distanced at first, both emotionally and physically, but by the end of this play, you're so wrapped up in it. Give it the time it needs to work its magic on you, and it will. I think this is one of the best things Target Margin has done in a long time. Roll Dolls, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory is a beloved book, movie, and now a great big razzle-dazzle Broadway musical thanks to the sparkling music of Mark Shaman and the lyrics of Shaman and Scott Whitman with a book by David Grieg. Christian Borle plays the wily Willy Wonka who hands out golden tickets to an assortment of obnoxious children to take a tour of his factory with a grand prize for the winner. I love every version of this story, and this was one of my favorite musicals this season, which was Chalk a Block, or Chocolate a Block, full of fabulous musicals. Christian Borle was perfect as a splashily dressed, easily vexed, purveyor of the finest candy ever devised. Ryan Faust, who was the person I saw, the Charlie I saw, seemed to step right out of the pages as the hopeful, wishful, imaginative Charlie. John Rubenstein, Pippin himself, was the spryest, twinkliest, irrepressible grandpa I've ever seen. My friend Beth thought the Oompa Loompas were phenomenal. Roald Dahl would be thrilled by the way these actors captured the revolting spirit of his characters of the kids and parents. There was glutinous Augustus Gloop, spoiled brat Veruca Salt, 
chewing gum YouTube star and pop diva Violet Beauregard and updated to today's use, my TV now is attached to all those devices and not just TV, while this poor mom, who is played by the brilliant Jackie Hoffman, is driven to drink by his rudeness. I mean, they just cast this so perfectly, and I know all the critics hated it, but you know what? Word of mouth, and a sweet mouth I'm sure it's going to be, will tell you this show is, and those Oompa Loompas, Basil Twist, the way he created those Oompa Loompas and with Joshua Burgos' choreography is just, oh my gosh, you're going to love this to pieces. I love, love, love Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Oh, and I just wanted to add, because a lot of people have been criticizing the sets by Mark Thompson, but they were wonderful, the sets, the, especially the, the grandparents in that bed was so cleverly done. So, really, there is, I can't say a single bad thing about this production, because there is nothing bad to say from me. Even I recently got to see Broadway Unplugged 2017, created, written, directed, and hosted by Scott Siegel, with Ross Patterson's Little Big Band. And this is the 15th time that uh, Broadway Unplugged presented a grand evening of Broadway standards, operetta classics, pop songs, and some obscurities without any amplification in the large town hall. For me, one of the highlights, Clea Blackhurst outdid Ethel Merman in clarity and the ability to milk every single joke from Annie Oakley's lament, you can't get a, a man with a gun. And there was even a verse I'd never heard of oh, before. Man. So I was really, I mean, it was great. That was super special. Brian Charles Rooney did the operetta number, uh, Lover Come Back from the Swan Song of the Operetta Era. And he paired with Farrah Alvin for one of my favorite duets, You've Lost That Loving Feeling, which could be included thanks to Carol King's Beautiful. And there were so many other wonderful things. Max von Essen did I'll Build a Stairway to Paradise, and I think he did a better job than I remember him doing on Broadway in American in Paris, and I loved him in that. And Erin Davy, I mean, I had no idea she had this beautiful operatic voice with Ben Davis, who we know from, uh, mm. Moul uh, not Moulin Rouge, um, oh, what's it called? I'm, Le Boheme. Thank you. <laughs> They did all the things you are for very warm for me, which mm -hmm. was like the only hit from this yes. this obscure musical that that crashed and burned. And I mean, you have Emily Skinner and Leslie Margarita, Stephanie Block doing and Judy McLean, who are these powerhouse singers. So to hear their pure voice without that dreadful application, and these people don't need it. That's just a, they have such great singers that I wish they never used amplification. Yeah, and with real talent singing real songs that you could hear that it's coming from their body it is just so much more wonderful than this disembodied you know amplifier and you that get ruins the songs and you get musicals like secret garden which jill pasted would come to my garden which you know you just don't hear them anymore it's an obscurity so coming <laughs> up is uh brought his usual broadway by the year at may 12th may, may 22nd. 22nd i knew it had it too yeah may okay. 22nd at town hall and also as is my tradition, I always catch up with Scott Siegel at the Drama Desk nominations at 54 Below, and he talks about all the stuff coming up. So later on in the broadcast, you will hear Scott Siegel enumerating all the wonderful things coming up. And again, you know what? So far, so far, this entire show, everything we've seen has gotten a happy face. That's pretty amazing. Yes, it's good out there. Marry Harry is a musical about the fast-track romance of a cook who wants to leave his father's ro uh, restaurant to work as a sous chef in a fancy bistro, and a young woman who has broken up with her fiancé and contends with an interfering mom. What would theater be without children trying to be independent of their uh, parents and, or, uh, you know, uh, lousy fiancés? It's very slight. Um, the the conflicts seem like easily resolvable, and become really easily resolvable. But this is a this is a musical that has a lot of charm, and that's that's the main thing about it. Uh, the charm is in the acting. The charm is in the songs. Even the set is charming. It's a cartoon version of the East Village. These elements make this very slight musical, very enjoyable. 
And we have some uh, interviews of the cast afterwards. Yes, we had a chance to talk to Lenny Rolpe, David Spadora, Morgan Colling, Robin Sky, and the Village Voices Ben Chavez, Claire Saunders, and Jesse Manocherian. Here we are with Lenny Wolpe. And you are in Mary Harry. Oh my God! Why don't you want him to be a chef? I mean, he's a, it's still part of the business. Well, I think he, I think he is a great chef, and for me, I think it's just handing down generation to generation. And once he leaves. It's like that that continuum's gone, and then but Big Harry comes to the realization that he has to let his son go and has to let him grow. And if times change, they change. But it's a big leap for him because he didn't leave, his grandfather didn't leave, his great grandfather, you know. So it's the end of a, the lineage, and that's a tough thing to accept. Yeah, it you know, is. You have to, it's a good dad. You have to let them, you know, fly and flap their wings and create the way they need to. So like the village voice, they like to flap their wings a lot. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, David Spadora. And you get to be the object of desire. <laughs> Little Harry, as he goes by, yeah. So you meet your dream, and then you kill your father's dream. <laughs> you terrible son. I mean, it, it's it's really hard to, to to have your own dreams not not overshadow those of uh, the, uh, the ones that the ones that you love their dreams too. It's hard not to overshadow that. Wonderful village voices fluttering around in the background. They're amazing, and they're in our heads. We don't see them. We just hear things, and they kind of dictate uh, our biggest fears and our biggest dreams. Yeah, through the through the entire rehearsal process, we had the writers there, uh, which is has been such a blessing because uh, they're such wonderful people, and they were so open to, uh, to changing things up and trying new things. It was as much a workshop as it was a rehearsal process, and uh, the healthiest version that I could imagine. Our, our director Bill is um, has such a beautiful eye for finding the truth in scenes. He he reeled everything in from showy music theater and uh, wanted to find. The, the heart of each character's intention and, and, and uh, I think we really chipped away and found uh, the heart of the story uh, that, that talks all about family and dreams and love and uh, new chances. Here we are with Morgan Cowling. And you are the one who wants to marry Harry. <laughs> yes, that's me. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, right through the middle of the show, she's like, one day, let's get married. She's a modern woman. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, you were already ready to marry someone else. You're, 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 you're the marrying kind. You're the multi-marrying kind. Yeah, she was, she was in a whirlwind of emotions in this show. She's engaged and gets broken up with while she's trying on her wedding dress and all hell breaks loose. And then she's like, I'm going to go meet some guy. And he invites her to have an Italian tasting. And then they fall in love in one night. And she's like, hey, I'm ready to get married. Let's do this. So. Yeah, once you get a taste of Italian, that's it. Oh, yeah, that's right. Exactly. Yeah, baby. <laughs> those storylines can be when they're made real you know and to follow that through it, it, with really fun songs and the three voices who are incredibly talented just making light of things that you know is enjoyable for me on stage i call it a rom-com with music yeah. <laughs> robin sky and you get to do that wonderful la 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 song. I, know, I have so much fun. Who gets to skip anymore, especially at my age? So Would you like to have the village voices with you all the time yes, in real life? It's like underscoring my life. How interesting. The soundtrack to my life. Yes. That's a great idea. Who knew? So, what's it like being the mother of the bride? It's sort of fabulous. I don't have any children, and Morgan and I are so close that I actually, at times, believe that I'm the mother of the bride. I mean, it's it's wonderful. And, um, you know, getting to work with her is such a treat, so it's a good thing. And it's also, what can be better than having this brilliant shopping experience where you get to buy the most beautiful dress ever? I know, I know. In the chicest place, in this cool, unknown place in New York, where they have the gorgeous, gorgeous original dresses. I know, it's kind of fabulous. It is, it is. I win. I'm Ben Chavez. Claire Saunders. I'm Jesse Manicharian. And these are the village voices that we've been talking about this entire evening. The characters love you. <laughs> oh, Thank you. so much fun for us. Yeah, really. Uh, 
the songs are everything in this show. I, I mean, like, I love the book of this musical, but we get to pop up and be the magical musical world of it. And yeah. That's, that's what got me into musical theater when I was young and seeing shows at the York, actually. So I love being able to do that on the stage. And I think that there are, you know, I think musical theater is particularly um, moving when the songs actually move a character forward. You know, a lot of times they'll be like, oh, this moment has a song and, and nothing will happen within the song. But I think that this piece is unique um, in the uh, in the positive way of, of the fact that the songs move the characters forward and we and it's really wonderful that we get to be part of that movement. I was gonna say know? that's our job yeah. really, right? To keep this thing moving forward, to keep pushing them into the next stage or the next scene. Mm -hmm. And also the emotions. You, you you bring out all the emotions. Yeah, absolutely. I mean we definitely are are sort of embodying the thoughts that are in these characters' minds, you know, which is fun, fun and exciting for us. Yeah, and we've talked about how we don't necessarily know, you know, it's, it's not like we're all-knowing voices, you know, that, that when we take the breath, we're taking, we're, we're, we're checking in with them, we're figuring out where they are and then being able to know where to push them or, or, or where to, you know, force them to breathe, to have that moment of reflection, you know, and that's, I think, a unique part about this Greek chorus is that, it, that we are... Um, we're not all knowing, and and we are uh, sharing the experience. Yeah. yeah, we're guiding and sharing in the experience. We're like along for the ride too. Yeah. You know? And now I have the opportunity to talk to Tori Scott, headlining at Joe's Pub, and she is fiercely funny with the powerhouse voice. So this should be fun. Hi, I'm Tori Scott. We are live from Joe's Pub Dressing Room where I am doing three nights of a brand new show here at Joe's Pub on Mondays, May 8th, May 15th, and May 22nd. It is called Plan B because now everyone has to have a good plan B. It has comedy and songs and storytelling. If you like Judy Garland, if you like Lady Gaga, if you like everything in between, come check out Plan B. We're also going to be recording a live album all three nights, so please come and check it out. Oh, anything. I mean, really, this is all about um, my poor life decisions, um, as well as how I'm coping with the change in the political climate. So I think everyone can relate to that. So you're going to hear things from heart. You're going to hear things from the drifters. Uh, you're going to hear a little bit of uh, show tunes, even. And it's a, it's a wide range of genres. I like to think of it as like a mixtape, so all of these stories uh, connect through song, and um, songs can really spark a memory that you might not think of until you hear the song, and that's sort of what I like to do in these shows. But a lot of it is very self-deprecating, but I think relatable because I think everyone can relate to those bad, deci bad decisions they've made in life and wish they could do them over. <laughs> uh, I did a degree in musical theater at the Boston Conservatory, and I was going to pursue Broadway, which, by the way, if anyone's Broadway's watching, I still am pursuing Broadway. Um, but I wanted to perform. I didn't want to just audition and, and keep going in for things and not booking them. And I did uh, a show at a gay bar maybe about six, seven years ago, and it went over really well. And five years ago, someone from Joe's Pub saw it, booked me here. The shows have gotten bigger, they've gotten sillier, um, they've gotten more self-deprecating, and the audience really seems to like it. And tell me about your following. Well, it's, um, it's, an, it's a wonderful following in New York. It's a huge gay following. And I just actually, uh, from these shows, I was able to book a cruise ship, a gay cruise ship for a week in the Caribbean. So now I have a huge following of predominantly gay bears, but I don't discriminate. I like all kinds of gay men. Um, and they're very loyal fans, and I really appreciate it. They've seen my shows, then they bring people to see my shows, and it's all about word of mouth, which has helped me go on this journey and build a bigger fan base. So thank you to everyone who's seen my show. Hello there, I'm Scott Siegel. I'm a producer, writer, director, host of a variety of shows, uh, some of them here at 54 Below. Uh, I generally do about three shows a month here on average. Uh, I have a monthly show uh, that's on an unusual schedule and it has its uh, arbitrary schedule, but it's once a month uh, called 54 Sings, Broadway's Greatest Hits. Uh, we've done, oh, uh, 
I think by the time this airs, we'll have done 15 of them, uh, going on 16, 17, 18. We have one a month booked throughout the entire year. We're at 54 Below, Feinstein's slash 54 Below. And uh, what that show is, is you know, we get... We pick the greatest songs from the Broadway canon, and uh, we get today's great singers to sing them. And uh, uh, it's a very popular series; otherwise, they wouldn't have been doing it uh, every month. Uh, and I, I put that together and get great people to sing and and uh, host it. It's like a little mini Broadway by the year right here at uh, at, at Feinstein slash Fifty Four Below. The other thing, uh, speaking of uh, Broadway by the years, uh, we're in the middle of our seventeenth season. Uh, and we have two more shows to go for Broadway by the Year. We have the, we're doing the last 20 years of Broadway cut, cut between two different shows. We're doing 1997 to 2006, those 10 years, on May 22nd with an all-star cast. Uh, uh, among the people who'll be in that are Emily Skinner and Christina Bianco and uh, Josh Young. Uh, we have a sensational cast of people. Uh, uh, Full interviews of Mary Harry with the musical numbers are on the Facebook page. I am so sad that Emily is closing. It's such a good show, so if you get a chance, go. And I'm going to see this May 14th. And the Edgar Allan Poe Festival is going on. And American Mills, you can find Leslie's review on our Facebook page. She loved it. Charlie and the Chocolate Factory is a lot of fun, and the play that goes wrong is hysterical. Uh, Kevin Klein and Present Laughter just got a Out of Critic Circle Award. The Obies are May 22nd as well, and uh, Encore's last thing is the Golden Apple. Last show at New Victory, and what he was Scott was talking about Broadway's greatest hit will be May 13th, 9:30 at um, 54 Below. Richard Skipper celebrates the songs of World War II, Saturday, May 20th, at the Lori Beachman. Wilfried Wald at 92nd Street Y, the Lower East Side Festival of the Arts, Memorial Day weekend. Edward Einhorn's Marriage of Alice B. Tokel is it here. And remember, you can find out all the reviews we talked about and longer reviews at the um, Facebook page. And uh, Ground Rounds at La Mama, I am going to see that. It's got my friend Glenn Heroy in it. And we're also going to be seeing uh, Entertaining Mr. Sloan at uh, Wild Project. Classic Overtures at, uh, at Classic Stage Company, New York Theatre Workshop has, and reviews that we talked about on our Facebook page that have closed, and shows that we're going to that are closing by May 14th, and don't forget to pick up your Performing Arts Insider, the Cultural Heartbeat of New York City, our next show is May 27th, again, Facebook page for everything.